Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session in the course on technology and the future of medicine. Today we're talking about a very interesting subject, evil as a treatable disease, a critique of Simon Baron Cohen's book, The Science of Evil, that uh, suggests that evil is a bit like uh, autism and could perhaps be treated through the same mechanisms. Now, I'm going to talk about something entirely different. I don't think there's very much relationship between evil and, and feedback from the students, but, but I could be wrong. So anyway, um, my, my plan currently for March the 1st, we have four students who have signed up to present. I'd like to get three more so that we'd have seven on that day and eight on uh, April 11th. That seems to me to make a pretty good split. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm still eager. Some of you have said you're, you're, you're feeling an internal tendency to, to, to present on, on the first, but you haven't yet decided. So anyway, I, I hope you, you, you decide soon. Anyway, student feedback, you may wonder whether we ever read what the students write to us, and I want to tell you that we've just gotten the detailed feedback from fall 2012, and there's some quite interesting things there, and I, I wanted to kind of react to that and tell you a bit of my philosophy of the course. Many of you know that the easiest way to find the website, at least the website for the fall uh, version of the course is using the URL singularitycourse.com. And it may give you the impression that everything in this course is about the singularity and that everything needs to be related to the singularity and every idea we bring up uh, has to do with that. And that's really not how I feel about the course. I don't think that would be a valid course if we did that. Um, and, and so that, that's perhaps the main thing I, I, I'm going to talk about in these remarks. But anyway, the feedback on Jonathan Schaefer was perhaps more time was needed for discussion. Otherwise, don't change a thing. Leslie Cormack, the Dean of Arts, um, one of the comments, another good presentation, although the overarching principles here need more discussion. How do emerging populations integrate technology? Why do we consider these singularity topics? Okay, you got that? And uh, what lessons can we learn from our own history to apply to situations like these? Where is their gold rush, their space race? So she was talking about the Middle Ages and the fact that the medical system there was in many senses as complete as the one we have now. It was just different. But it, it had uh, you know, approaches and treatments for every problem and ways to explain things, just like we have now. And uh, it was a remarkably interesting presentation. Now, Dr. Cormack had asked me how she could possibly present in this case. <laughs> she hardly knew what the singularity was. And I think it's actually healthy and valuable to have some presentations from people who hardly know what the singularity is but have, have a lot of valuable thoughts about you know, technology and the future, as, as she obviously does. But I think she'll also find these remarks very stimulating. She was kind of worried about the fact that I said that we are constantly fine-tuning the course. We're making it different every year. And for her as a Dean of Arts, her preparation for pre presenting in this course is not like the most important thing she has to do. But now she has a specific idea of where she might go. Uh, in terms of reaction to my own uh, presentations, many of you are, are aware of something called personalized medicine. And I really didn't talk about that at all. And I think it, it would be good for you to hear something about that. And, and so I, I am clearly going to say something about that as this course goes on was suggested there should be more material that ties into popular conceptions of medical singularities, i.e., where are we on the timeline of technological development in medicine, new treatments coming out that aren't popularized outside of mainstream medicine, and uh, so on. So I, I'd be happy to talk about 
those things and I will find occasion to do so. So let's go back then to my main point, which is what is this course about really? And should everything be related to singularitarian thinking? I think, and I've always felt, that we need technology skeptics as well as technology advocates. And this is not just a whim that I have. I think, in a sense, to be successful, we need that. If you think of high-profile publications, where, places where we might want to put a, a journal article, most of them probably wouldn't take something that's entirely technological singularity oriented. They'll start by not knowing what that is, and they'll end by thinking that whatever it is, it shouldn't be the entire focus of an article for their prestigious journal. On the other hand, if we make it just part of what we're uh, talking about, I, I, I think we have, we have a much better chance. And it's not just journals, it's the real world, the corporate boardrooms and fine parties that you might find yourself at. You can imagine at a party, if you start talking about the singularity, that at certain parties, people might start moving away. They might call you a cab, say that you're really looking tired and they think maybe you should, you should get on home, you know? Whereas if you balance it a bit and start talking about karma and the cyclical nature of life and all that, kind of thing, and they get the idea that you're knowledgeable about many different approaches to these things. I think the party will go better, whatever you're doing in the corporate boardroom will go better, and, and uh, it's easier to get papers accepted. So I, I just find it practical. You know, we're in the early stages of a course like this. I think later on it will be possible I have a course that's about the singularity only, and that'll work fine. But we're not really at that phase yet. Um, and I think aiming for diversity and balance is a good thing. It's very useful to be able to look through at everything through the singularitarian lens. What would that be like, you know, looking at things that way? But it's also useful to have alternative ways of looking at things. Being able to craft talking points that work for all audiences in all uh, situations. So that's kind of what my aim is for you, uh, is to give you kind of street cred, what, whatever you want to say, to, to, you know, to make you capable of dealing with many different situations where people are talking about the future or expecting you to talk about the future. Uh, I think having only one line probably isn't going to work, but I do want you to end up knowing that one line pretty well, but it's, it's just part of what we're teaching. So in, any uh, questions about that? And maybe the other thing I should say is that in the beginning, when I was planning the course, I thought of Earl Waugh as one of the premier skeptics who would be valuable to have as a part of the course. And uh, Bibiana Kujek also, who, who you'll meet uh, later. She, she gives the, the talk about uh, singularity issues in resource limited settings and uh, uh, Nepal. And um, I, I think you'll find the two of them some of the most fascinating people, not only you've met in the course, but maybe in your entire life. And so, you know, what, what I. I, I, I think you'll find that we're better off for having that kind of uh, diversity. Having said that, let me see if I can get rid of my PowerPoint and find Dr. Waz here, and then we'll pass the microphone on to him <coughs> so he can tell you his thoughts on Simon Baron Cohen's book. Well, it's great to be here. As you can see, I've got my biker outfit on. So, uh, so after we're done here, we can go for a ride. How's that? Um, I guess I should give you some information about myself because after, you know, Kim's introduction, you might think that, you know, I'm from Lower Slavovia or something. The fact is that I was trained at the University of Chicago 
in a uh, discipline called the history of religions, and, and I had to specialize, and so I specialized in, in um, Aboriginal traditions and in Islamic traditions. And I was one of the most unique individuals at the University of Chicago for my two um, areas of specialization. And, um, and then I moved, uh, I taught in the United States for several years, and then uh, a position came available here, and I came back to Canada. I have to tell you a little bit about that. <clears throat> it's always a joke to me because, you see, I got a call to come to Alberta, and um, I had been teaching in the States for several years, and since you're all good, you know, real, live, red-blooded Canadians, you'll know uh, what that means, you know, you come back to Canada, and, you know, um, after you've lived in the United States for nine or ten years, I can tell you that you become a Canadian in many, many ways that you didn't think possible. So I came back to Canada and I called my sister in Ontario and I said, guess what? I got a job in Canada. She said, oh, that's great. What university are you going to? I said, the University of Alberta. There was dead silence. She said, that's not Canada, that's the West. So if you think that there is no particular purchase in culture and in cultural studies, you better think again, because there's an awful lot of unwashed people out there, including my sister, who think that you don't even live in Canada. And that means uh, there's uh, divisions within the way people think, even about being Canadian, that are uh, multi-dimensional, multifaceted. And I can tell you that when it comes to singularity, there's the same kind of diversity, okay? And I'm one of those on the other side of the diversity issue, okay? So um, where we might have a cult leader, in, in um, our friend Kim, I'm, I'm kind of the guy that stands on the outside with rotten tomatoes and, you know, throws them. Okay. So here's what I'll take you a quick run through, and then I hope we can have some discussion, okay? Um, maybe I should preface my remarks about um, my stance towards science. Because, you see, um, uh, one of the problems that I have with a, a kind of absolute scientific model, and the one uh, that is now predominant, I think, in or has been in medicine up to our time, is um, that the more science you've got in the mix, the better the care will be, and the better outcomes there will be. In, in point of fact, I want you to think about that. Because you see, science really is based upon memory. It's based upon an acceptance that the past is the same as the present, and, is, and that the present is the same as the future. I want you to think about that in this course. Because the notion that technology and the future of medicine can be parsed by our methodology is is a question mark that you should hold over yourself and hold over what we do here. So in effect, the whole notion that science is replicatable is built upon the notion that memory exists beyond time and space. It exists, in other words, you can find the same kind of replication here and here, and you remember this kind of thing over here. Have you ever wondered how that was possible? So, in effect, doesn't the context change if you uh, replicate a scientific study here and here? What are the assumptions behind that kind of um, um, notion? And we have the same problem when we come to, to looking at future things, i.e., we usually build our models upon a kind of fixed assumption system that rests upon the, the very foundations of science. And so one of the problems that you're going to wrestle with, and I hope you wrestle with it quite outside this class, and I hope you wrestle with it for the rest of your life, because 
both Kim and my generations, we haven't solved it. And the problem is this. What kind of foundational knowledge is possible to say that it exists the same from one time period to the other? And what, time, what does time have to do with the way in which we perceive these things? So that's one assumption that I have seen as foundational to this course, because you see, right from the word go, Kim and I agreed that we would not use one kind of methodological structure, so we would not give you some kind of dogma. So in effect, what we want you to do is to wrestle with the issues. The second point I want you to see is that in any discussion of technology and the future of medicine, any time in the past, and here you see I refer to the past, in any time in the past, there has always been an ethical dimension. There's always been an ethical issue. There has always been an issue that says, is this the way humans are constructed? And when, oh, as soon as you raise that issue, you raise the ethical issue. So from my perspective, I hope what you get out of this class is the fact that as a human being, you always bring an ethical lens to what you're seeing and what you're doing. And regardless of whether we have the same view about what that ethics is, I think, and my foundational uh, understanding in my critique of Simon Baron Cohen is precisely this, that we do not always see the same ethical norms being applied in medicine, and we do not see it always applied the same in science. So therefore, it is, it is part of your responsibility in, in developing this field and in trying to get a, a, a handle on the future what it is, what is good, sound, solid, basic um, uh, principles upon which you can build your understanding of the future. Okay, so that's the rant, okay, and that's the commercial. Now you can go to sleep. Okay, so here's what I want to do today. As you can see, I've got a whole lineup of things for us to go through, and I hope we can get through them quickly. Um, I want to talk, first of all, about the background for Byron Cohen's book, which has um, certainly made waves, and I think probably I should alert you to the fact that Byron Cohen has got a brother who is a comedian, and I think you can imagine the kinds of problems he has when he goes to parties. The next thing I want to talk to you about is an experience I had when I was a young guy, which was about five years ago. And I want to tell you about uh, what happened to me then, because I think it bears on trying to understand this. Then I want to do, uh, uh, give you a kind of quick once over of his thesis in the book. And then I want to talk to you about his uh, concept of zero negative and zero positive and the genetic evidence. And then I want to uh, go into some, uh, what I think are significant critiques of his thesis, okay? So, um, here's, his, here's his background. He comes from a study of what I would call behavioral psychology, okay? He comes out of behavioral psychology. He is in psychology and psychiatry. And um, he comes out of this, and his particular area of study is autism. And his focus on autism then uh, has led him to see that there are four different kinds of conditions uh, in which people exhibit lack of empathy. And he wants to analyze these kind of lack of empathy conditions to see what's common among them so that he can determine the, um, the basis of this. So there's psychopathy, there is narcissism, there's autism and Asperger's syndrome. Does, do any of you know um, any of these uh, particular categories? Do you know people who have at autism? Are you aware of that? Yes, yeah, so some of you do. How about Asperger's syndrome? Yeah, so there are people here who know what this is and who have to deal with this, and it's not an easy thing to deal with. It's very, very difficult. Well, here's what he, he wants to argue. He wants to argue that um, you, he can take this study on the lack of empathy and he can build it into a way of looking at the whole problem of evil. 
In other words, he sees the, the classic forms of evil in our culture, which in his case is Hitler. He wants to see the rise of people like Hitler as a result of the lack of empathy. And so therefore he wants to take the notion of evil out of the whole theological environment that created this notion. The notion of evil, of course, goes back to the early Hebrews and back beyond that to the ancient Semitic times, but it has been incorporated into sacred texts and it has become part and parcel of the thinking structure of whole civilizations ever since that. So he wants to argue that this theological category of, of sin or evil does not apply or does not um, explain the existence of evil. Moreover, he tries to um, eliminate the whole notion of, of the notion of devil. That is a supernatural evil force that, that stirs people up and, and, and results in them being motivated to do evil. Okay, so he wants to take the whole notion of evil out of the theological and religious domain, and he wants to try to explain it according to uh, his analysis of autistic behavior relative to empathy. That's what he's trying to do. Now, another thing that you should keep in mind is then that this is not for him necessarily a personal thing. In other words, he wants to see the patterns that he sees in autism as, as, a, as being replicated in other kinds of social situations. So in, in effect then, he wants to argue that there is a kind of social autism that develops in cultures. And this kind of social autism uh, can, can lead to things like the growth of fascism and can lead to um, evil kinds of things in the world. Moreover, he wants to argue, and, and in some respects I appreciate what he's trying to do, he wants to argue that this is not exactly a physical thing. In other words, he's psychologist enough and behavioralist less so when he comes to argue here. He really wants to argue definitively that this is not just a cause-effect thing that's going on in the brain. Not, not that. He really wants to argue, in fact, that there is a complex going on in the neuron construction of the brain of an autistic person and someone with Asperger's that, that indicates a pattern that can have social significance. Now that takes it, you see, away from being an individual malady or illness. That lifts it into the social domain. That's why he can argue then that this is not a, a theological category because obviously theology is a social activity. Anyway, um, he argues that it reflects a variety of categories. And so, very briefly, um, here is a, an outline of the brain that he worked with. And here are some of the areas um, that are what he thinks involved in the pathways in the brain that deal with autistic behavior. Now, I don't have time to go through all of these, and anyway, you're probably not interested in that. But what I do want to bring to your attention is his analysis of what he calls the empathy circuit. Now, he did this by uh, having autistic children, mostly because he worked with children, he had autistic children and he did MRIs of their brains when there were certain kinds of empathetic situations um, arose. In other words, he would present these children with this kind of behavioral pattern and say, okay, here is a case, now how are you going to deal with this? And then he did an MRI of the brain to see what uh, happened to it. Well. He went through this and he found there were six different levels of empathy built into the brain. And he built up then what he calls an empathy quotient questionnaire. 
and he went through with this MRI evidence, and as you can see, I've listed the areas in which he thought um, there was obviously an input from the autistic behavior. Um, all of this is available on uh, your computers, I believe, right? It's already out, so uh, I don't need to go over it all for the moment. But I want to point out to you that he has argued that there are several different levels in the brain. This is not a simplistic model. He's arguing that there are seven, several different levels in the brain with several different kinds of interlocking uh, behavioral patterns in the brain. So he's arguing then that the notion of, of lack of empathy is a wiring issue in the way in which these various levels fit together. So out of this analysis, then he comes to this conclusion that there are in all of these patterning and in, and in these various levels when they come together, there are four different ways of looking at this. And he sees then uh, several different categories, uh, which uh, uh, behavioral categories, which he, he gives a, a characterization to. And the first is zero negative. And the personality disorder borderline, a type B, extremely say, uh, saying destructive things to others. Now maybe Marilyn Monroe is not somebody that you uh, relate to today, not like Lindsay Lohan or somebody like that, but the, the fact of the matter is that Marilyn Monroe was something like Lindsay. Um, she was off the wall in a number of different ways and um, if you worked with her on the set, apparently she uh, she could say some rather nasty and, and um, cutting things on the set so that leading men were put off a bit. Um, so uh, the fact is that she had a, a personality, a borderline personality disorder. Then what he calls a psychopath, he calls this type P. This is a total detachment from others' feelings. If you've dealt with an autistic child, you know that one of the things that absolutely stuns you is the way that an autistic child can have no particular feeling of what they have done or what they are doing. That is, if you have a box of chocolates and you want to share it with everybody at the birthday party, an autistic child could just as well run and grab the box of chocolates and run into another room and begin stuffing his face with the chocolates and not want to share them at all. So in effect then, the behavioral of the psychopath is this is mine and everything is mine and I'm not having anything to do with you because I am who I am. So the autistic statement about the psychopath is really total detachment from the whole kind of social environment. Then there's the narcissistic type N, total entitlement of self, using others. That is in the case where you get a, an individual who has an autistic behavioral pattern that says, okay, I don't care about you, I don't think about you, but even more, that individual uses you. So, for example, the autistic child can play along with you, right? And can say, you know, why don't we do this together? And then all of a sudden, at a critical moment in the activity, bang! He pulls the rug out from under you and you're left there with your mouth hanging open. What's going on here? Why are you taking this over? What's going on? I mean, we're not doing this together? No, the autistic child wants all this stuff revolving around themselves and he will use you as a way to get what he wants. Well, the, the most obvious and most egregious kind of thing is when you have a child in a class like that. You can imagine being a teacher trying to deal with that kind of behavior in two or three students. It's really 
very difficult. Now, the other kind of examination that he does is that related to Asperger syndrome. In, a, in, a, in, a, in an incorporation uh, that I did a few years ago, I worked with Alberta Caregiver Society to deal with um, a caregiving issues. And in one of the research projects that we did, we looked at young caregivers. And I interviewed a young caregiver who, who was about uh, 19 or 20, and he had been caring for an invalid mother for at least five or six years. And um, in fact, perhaps longer than that. And you know what he said to me? I hate my mother. He said, I have to do everything for her. I have to get her into the john. I have to bathe her. I have to get the groceries for her. I have to feed her. He said, I hate every minute of this. There's nothing in this for me. I was absolutely stunned. So I said, well, look, buddy, you better tell me um, why you feel this way. And he says, because I have Asperger's syndrome. Just like that. I said, so you can hate your mother because you have Asperger's syndrome. He said, yeah. And my interest in looking after her is only because I have to. She's all that she's got in the world, and they'd probably throw me in jail if I didn't take care of her. Besides, she pays the bills. Avoidance of social, lonely obsession. And finally, what he calls as zero positive is autistic. That is underactivity and empathy without words for emotions. A systematizer to the extreme. Those of you who work with aut autistic children will know that they are just absolute machines. They will absolutely control situations in, in every way possible according to their own system of understanding. Uh, the, the other aspect of autistic children is often that they are brilliant. That is, they, they can see things and do things in a way that you would not conceive of. All right, so he reviews one other kind of thing, and that is the genetic evidence for uh, his thesis that um, you can describe uh, the lack of empathy this way. And he looks at uh, the DNA analysis, and he looks at, for example, the notion of the MAOA-H gene. For those of you who have done DNA research, you will know that um, in some populations there is a gene that seems to predispose them to violence. And the predisposition to violence um, is, is well known under this rubric because the Maori people in New Zealand are known to be absolutely violent. That is, in the past, the warrior culture um, in, in New Zealand among the Maori people has been vigorous, um, offensive, and violent. And that they will, on, on every occasion, uh, turn on the enemy and try to absolutely destroy them. Now, the, the current group of, uh, of footballers, right? Uh, the Black Watch, I think it is, uh, from uh, New Zealand, who control mainly the international football world. Uh, they are representative of this kind of gene. In other words, they use this as a kind of model for how they're going to play football on the field. And if you've ever seen the New Zealanders play, you have to think that they've got a real dose of this. So the whole point is that from his perspective, there, there, does have, there does seem to be a behavioral model that is rooted in the DNA, and that this DNA comes out 
and is therefore can be tied into his analysis of empathy. So then he also argues that um, when you look at emotional recognition issues, you can see that there are um, available uh, chemical reactions that go on in the brain that modify behavior in significant ways. And so when you look at this, for example, you probably know about serotonin. Uh, serotonin transmitter is one of those things that, that we all have and that this, this uh, serotonin uh, transmits um, positive um, responses within the brain. And a lack of, ser of uh, serotonin uh, usually leads to depression and other kinds of uh, mental states. So he argues then that with the, the possibility of this kind of emotional activity going on in the brain, we also have another physical dimension for this uh, evidence. And um, he thinks that there is uh, linkage between the, the uh, arginine uh, vasopressin receptor in, in autism, and he believes that this is linked then to um, autism in a very direct way. And finally, he argues that when you look at out, when you look outside of autism, you find that people who have empathy ex um, express a wide variety of genes that what we would call em empathetic. That is, there's behavioral patterns established among human beings that uh, emphasize this empathetic gene. Now, I want to tell you about Georgie Fluter. Um, when I was in school, I went to a one-room school in Ontario in which there were um, about six different classes. And uh, that's how old I am, yeah. Um, we went to this one-room school and I lived in a, na in a farming community in Ontario uh, near, uh, outside of Hamilton, north of Hamilton towards Guelph. And all of the kids in that class, pretty well, for, were farmers, except for me. Um, my dad was a machinist. And so, um, in this one-room school, we had a teacher by the name of Mrs. Brock, and Mrs. Brock liked me. I was the resident nerd, right? I don't suppose you are, but uh, does anybody know what I'm talking about when you're a resident nerd in the class? Yeah, well, that was me. And so Mrs. Brock just thought I was the cat's meow. I didn't have anything to do with that. She just thought I was the cat's meow. Well, Georgie Fluter was a tough farm boy from back the concession, and Georgie Fluter was built like a brick backhouse and he was as strong as a bloody horse. And he didn't like me. And we had to walk together home after school many an evening, and you know, Georgie would just say, you're such a teacher's pet. You know, you're such a creep. I'd like to wipe the road with you. I hate your guts. So this went on for a while, and I knew what he was trying to do. He was trying to goad me into a fight. So one day I got up lots of courage, and I started fighting him on the way home. And I got absolutely destroyed. I went home with a black eye and bloody lip, and I was absolutely pulverized. So this is about grade six. Georgie Fluter belonged to the Orthodox Church in Hamilton. His family was, I think, Armenian. And Georgie <laughs> went to church every Sunday morning. Well, about midway through the year one year, we went to school in the morning and we heard the news. Georgie had been riding in the front seat of his father's car on the way to church on Sunday morning. 
And a car had come up a hill on the wrong side of the road and hit them head on. And Georgie went right through the windshield and broke his neck and he was dead immediately. Well, I hated Georgie. I hated his guts. I would just as soon he not have existed for one minute. And I, did, I sure did let it be known in my class that I didn't think much of Georgie Fluter. So when the news came to the class, you could imagine this one room class with everybody in there from grade, what, five right up to grade eight. And as soon as they announced that Georgie Fluter had been killed, everybody turned and looked at me. And then the question was, have I in fact, for me, did I kill Georgie? Had I destroyed him? I was a kid, right? And everybody in the class looked at me as much as to say, you killed Georgie Fluter. Well, we didn't have psychologists and all that to come and help with death in school at those times. And so I had to deal with the whole problematic of what to deal with this. And um, it was pretty clear to me that my classmates, want me to stop? Oh, okay. Um, it was pretty clear to me that my classmates thought I was evil, that I had some kind of evil power, that I had some kind of authority over life and death that they had never seen before. And they looked at me as if I was kind of weird. So you can imagine, we all had to go to the funeral. I had to go to the funeral and sit there and, and listen to the whole service and be aware of my colleagues staring at me and thinking, what did you do? What did you do? What did you do? And from then on, there was a kind of evil edge in their look. In other words, I had somehow or other brought about the death of Georgie by saying to him audibly in front of so many students, I wish you were dead. That has lived with me all my life. And it has had a profound effect on my understanding of evil. Because I understand then that evil is something that's comprehended socially. It's comprehended in a group. There has to be some kind of group awareness of evil. There has to be a sense of what constitutes an evil understanding. Now, whether or not you think that I was evil or not by telling Georgie that I wished he were dead, whether or not you think that as you're sitting there or not, matters nothing to me, right? Because I feel it. So therefore, the sense of evil that Simon Baron Cohen is talking about is not constructed by an objective force of evil, either in the brain or, I think, even in the society. I think that is too simplistic a model for what creates evil. So you can see then why Kim has me here to talk about this, because I want to argue 
that some of the greatest concepts in our society, in our culture, and many of the things that motivate medicine arise out of intangible things that can't be quantified, that can't be qualified according to a particular model of the brain and a particular structure of, within an autistic child. So here are some of the problems with his thesis that I have for you, and you can take them, you know, and mull them over. For me, the issue is, can you really develop empathy? How is it, you be, how is it that you develop a, a relationship with your mother, for example, that when she becomes old and feeble, you're going to say, Mom, I'll take care of you. And you won't be like this chap and say, you know, they'll throw me in jail if I don't. Where does that come from in you? Where does that kind of empathetic understanding come from? Can you develop that? Can cultures develop it? So the other issue that I want to raise with you is if you aren't empathetic, are you necessarily bad? And if you have an autistic child, you must wrestle with this on many different levels. Is it something you did? And the other thing I want you to think about when you read Simon Baron Cohen's book is, can a state be empathetic? Are we really talking about evil as a generation of a state thing? That is, can you ban the death penalty? Does that mean that the state is empathetic? Is that an example of being empathetic for a state? So if you were to argue that Canada has an empathetic character to it, what would you point to? Well, I think you could point to medicine in Canada as the basis for an empathetic expression, right? Right from the word go of establishing Medicare in Canada has been precisely this notion that we're going to take care of you when you can't take care of yourself. Is that empathetic? Yes. Can a state be empathetic? Yes. Have we voted for that kind of empathetic Canada? Yes. Do we continue to express it? Yes. So in effect then, the whole notion of, of empathy is larger than the individual and larger than the construction of the individual mind. Now, we've all had a problem of being super empathetic. I gave my brother an awful time when he was a kid. And he always wanted to play with me. You know, have you ever had a younger brother who is such a pain? You know, he's about, he's about five years younger than you are, and he's always horning in on your friends. He always wants this. You know what I'm talking about, or, you know? Okay, so some of you do. So he said to me one time, you know what? I, I really want to hang out with you today. I want to be with you today. So I was really mad. <laughs> so my father had been in the Navy, and he had one of these big old Navy bags, you know, the ones that stood about yay high and about this big around. So I said, okay, come with me. So I, I said, why don't you crawl in here? So he crawled in the, in, the, in the Navy bag. And so I zipped it up real quick like, and then I just flung him around like this in the air about six or seven times and let him go whoomp on the ground, right? <laughs> so I said, there, you know, I'm, I'm playing with you, aren't I? Well, the poor devil to this day, he, he thinks I tried to kill him. So, so, so is this being super empathetic? Yeah, could, I have, could this have killed him? Yeah, it could have, if he had hit his head the right way. I want to bring some other evidence up that I think critiques Simon Baron Cohen's thesis, and I want you to think about this too. 
I want you to read Daniel uh, Frankfurter's study sometime before you're dead and gone, okay? Because in, in um, uh, Daniel's study, you're going to find something that's going to shake you up a little bit. The bottom line is that he argues in a true scientific fashion, I think, that in fact, every different society embodies um, evil in a different way. And he, has, he argues, as in effect, um, using the same kind of logic um, that the Dean of Arts did, that in fact, what you can see is patterns in history. And you can see these patterns reflected over and over again. And so here, in Daniel's book, is an argument that evil and the whole notion of evil is really a social construction. That is, it constructs evil in a certain way and we ritualize it. We build it into ritual systems. I'll just use one example and that is the witch hunts. The witch hunts in Europe and in England and in the United States were absolutely vicious. And they were not the product necessarily of a religious establishment that wanted to get rid of witches. It was a corporate kind of cultural thing. They defined witches as evil, and so they went after them and hung them whether or not they were guilty or not. So in effect, Frank Perkett argues that evil is never a personal thing. It is in embedded in and expressed through society norms. So it is really us as a corporate culture that defines what evil is. And every period of history then takes that notion of evil and uses it in its own way and for its own purposes. So his thesis then is that we when you're talking about evil, what you do is you ritualize a certain kind of negative behavior and you incorporate that into the psyche of the people and from that moment on, evil is defined that way. The other argument is that social values construct evil. That is, that the whole idea that you can trace a pattern in the brain and find that as the basis for a corporate development of evil is a huge leap of faith. Because the fact of the matter is that if, in fact, people do socially construct the notion of evil, and they are, and that notion of evil is endorsed by religion, is endorsed by law, is endorsed by a whole host of institutions, that that notion is really only for your time and place in society. Because you know very well that if you were to go now to South America or to Europe or to the Middle East or to Afghanistan or to China, you would find entirely different definitions of what evil is. So that the social uh, conception of evil does not vitiate the notion that there is evil, but it constructs it differently and with different definitions. My argument is that if we were to accept Simon Baron Cohen's model of how evil develops, that would not be possible. That is, that evil itself has to be defined by the social milieu in which it lives. And then finally, there is no notion of cruelty that's universal. I mean, there's all kinds of absolutely horrendous things that take place in this world, even today, even while you're living, and maybe even in this town. So the fact of the matter is that the notion of cruelty and evil um, has different plays in different places. All right, so here are some of the things that I want you to think about. What role does fear play in the defini definitions of cruelty and of evil? What role uh, does conspiracy play in the meaning of evil? Do you have to collude with your neighbor 
in order to bring about some kind of evil. Is it possible for you to be evil alone? What's the definition of evil which is found and what's the relationship of authorities in defining that? So does the priest tell you what's evil? Does Kim tell you what's evil? Do presidents tell you what's evil? Do popes tell you what's evil? Now I want to see your hands. How many of you think that that President Obama's use of, um, of these um, drone missiles in Afghanistan and in, in Yemen and in other places to kill Taliban type and Al Qaeda type uh, uh, leaders, do you think this is, is okay? You think it's okay? Do you think it's evil? Is this evil? Okay, so here is a problem where we have never, not just yet solved the issue, right? We have not culturally come to a decision about this. But isn't it a good example of the fact of how we're dealing with an evil in our time? So in effect then, culture defines this demonic or this chaotic. Now, another thing that I want to bring to your attention is the demonic in you. Was it nice of me to swing my brother around and throw him out like that? No, that, that was not nice. I mean, he has some very pointed things to say to me now, I'll tell you. So, this is not nice. And one of the things I've discovered in, my, um, in myself over the years is that there are elements in me that are absolutely chaotic, maybe even demonic. I don't understand them. There are, I do things sometimes that I don't understand. You know, it's, you know why, for example, you know, I would, uh, to, to use a, a, a non-issue uh, non problem, why do I insist that I have to have something to eat at some particular time? Why do I say I've got to have this? I've got to have this drink. What is it? What is it that motivates me to say, I've got to have this? And what does that, how does that chaotic element in your personality impact upon people around you? And how has that shaped your personality? So I, I think then that what we're dealing with is a much more complex phenomenon for those of you who want to look up something to study and to um, critique Baron Cohen's thesis, I found a couple for you to look at, okay? Now the first point is that autism and the structures that he talks about are not necessarily permanent. One would think and one would understand on the basis of his argument that in fact these continue unabated throughout the life of the child. They don't. In fact, some children grow out of it in relative ways and some children can be socialized in much different ways. So in other words, the range of treatments that we have now for autism point to the fact that there is not one kind of autism and there's a whole variety of things that you might use for this and that the notion of empathy and its foundation that he uses is not necessarily the way that would be permanently understood. The second thing that I want you to think about is that even from within a scientific model, there are absolute critiques of what he has argued and that is there are something like 40 billion neurons in your head. How can we say that there is only a handful of patterns that can develop what we would call empathy? So the issue that 
this uh, particular thesis points to is that decision making in your brain takes place in a number of different ways and we can't predict from one decision to the next what it would do and how you would do it. So when you go home tonight and you have your glass of beer and you're thinking about this thing, here's something to ask yourself. Are cruelty, evil, and lack of empathy one and the same thing? I don't believe it. I don't buy it. Are there differences between personal lack of empathy and the social perception of evil? Yes. Now finally, some other kinds of things. It is true that Hitler has left an absolutely indelible mark on Western culture. And I'm not one to denigrate the role of Hitler in defining evil in our society. But for most of you, he didn't exist when Hitler did. For most of you, the experience of Hitler and what he did is only learned through books and through the implications of what you can see in films and other kinds of things. I don't think that lives with you the way it lives perhaps with Kim in my generation. Because we encountered a kind of evil there that seemed to be transcended. It seemed to transcend anything that we had known before. The deliberate gassing of millions of people just seems to us absolutely off, off the wall. So my question to you is then, if he's talking about evil to me and uses Hitler, is he talking about the same thing to you? So what's your reference point for evil? Would you buy Hitler as it? You don't know him. Do you know the kind of social and cultural antagonism and agony that we went through at Hitler's time? No, you don't. Is it impossible to disengage the notion of evil from Western cultural experience? Take a good drink of wine before you try to answer that. Because it's laced with all kinds of religious meanings. Many of them are rooted so deeply in our psyche that we are not even aware that they're there. It's really impossible for you to disengage yourself from the culture in which you're living in order to make this kind of assumption. And the last thing I want to leave you with is this. Evil is real. Perceptions of evil for you can be life altering. As Georgie Fluter tells me. But can you really reduce them to the lack of empathy? No. Okay. Let's have a go. So can I stay here? Do I, can I come out? Yeah. I think uh, you can, whatever you're comfortable. Whatever I'm comfortable, okay. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I don't like standing behind here. I, I mean, I know you have all this problem with these gadgets. Well, we're trying to remain. He wants me to remain still. Te you know. Technologically advanced. I, I think I should may maybe explain the background for this subject. It has to do with Bill Joy, the CEO of Sun Microsystems, and what happened to him in the year 2000. He decided to write a book about uh, the fact that the future doesn't need us. The future doesn't need human beings. The future can exist without uh, human beings. But he became so depressed setting about writing this book that he never actually wrote it. He, he wrote an art article in Wired and he gave an uh, interview. I, I forget the name of the program, but it was on a talk program in the year 2000 that you can still find on uh, YouTube. And his main point was, we've reached the point of the democratization of evil, where individuals like yourselves could 
be enabled to wipe out thousands or millions of people in a way that was never possible before. That always before it was corporations and nation states that had that power, great evil power to wipe out huge numbers of people. Individuals never had it before. And he was arguing that now potentially they did. That one person, and we sort of saw this with you know the anthrax uh, things in, in um, 2001, one per person could terrorize or you know potentially harm a very large number of people. Um, and I suppose the fabric of this idea of the uh, democratization of evil runs through this course in the following simple way. You know that all the lectures are videoed at the highest possible quality, but there's one lecture that you'll never find on YouTube. The uh, last lecture of the course on uh, bioterrorism uh, and uh, anthrax, we're, we're afraid to put it on YouTube. We don't know for certain that we would cr be creating evil by doing so, but if there's one lecture that comes close to kind of you know, instructing somebody in how they would go about doing large evil, that's it. And so we don't circulate that. Um, so I, I guess that just gives you a little bit of the background that caused me to, to uh, bring Earl the book and you know, to get him to, to talk about this subject. So do some of you have uh, questions? All right, so my question kind of twists the theory a little bit, but if it's possible to isolate exactly what brings empathy to humans, is it possible to remove it? Is somebody going to try to remove it? Or can you expand it even beyond empathy to complete lack of emotion and try to turn people into maybe logical beings, complete logic without emotion? Is that something that's possible according to this theory? Well, let me, let me try to answer this from what I think Simon Baron Cohen would say. He would, he would argue, and as a, a scientist and a psychologist, he, his, his whole raison d'etre is to change behavior. And so, um, in, in all honesty, what he's trying to do is to find the root of this lack of empathy so that he can find some way of modifying it, yes. So his, his ultimate goal is to find some kind of combination of drugs or some kind of other um, model of uh, modification that can change an autistic child and make that child more adaptable in society. That's his ultimate goal. So um, is it possible to do that? Um, I take it you're asking me if I think that's possible to do, right? Yes. Well, um, it seems to me that if we follow Simon Baron Cohen's um, argument, that we ought to be able to argue that we can change the brain structure, that we can change it significantly enough to um, modify behavior. That is, as long as in my view, the genetic makeup of the individual is such that it allows you to do that. Um, um, can we do it now and will we do it in the near future? Um, I don't think so. Um, and there's a number of reasons why I don't think so. The first is because um, while I appreciate the fact that he's done this kind of research on autistic children, um, I don't think one size fits all in terms of autism itself. Uh, secondly, I don't think, um, I don't know how he did this kind of study. It seems to me very strange that he can get children to uh, buy into a certain scenario in order for his brain to think, uh, to take a picture of their brain to see what they're thinking at any one time. And the third reason why I think this is because I don't think we have yet 
established, um, what, a tenth of the capabilities of the human brain. I, I just don't think that the patterns that he has discovered show anywhere near the kind of sophistication of the human brain. I, I think of the Canadian soldier who was injured in Afghanistan. You remember the young uh, soldier who was there meeting with the elders and a young teenage boy came up with an ax and, and um, whacked him right in the head and, and cut, his, cut right through into the brain. And, and, and the, he was left paralyzed and without ability to speak and a huge uh, 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 slice down the middle of his brain. And um, I mean, for all intents and purposes, a, a medical people wrote him off. In other words, uh, they said, well, we'll find an institution for you to live in until you die. But his wife and, and um, other significant people said, that's not good enough. We, we can't do that with this man. He's in wonderful physical shape. He's a, a brilliant young soldier. He's really a very fine example of Canadian uh, military might. And, and so they said, okay, well, let's see what we can do with him. And what has happened to him if, by everybody's stretch of imagination is miraculous. Um, he is now sp speaking. He is walking um, hesitantly, but he can walk. And his goal is to be what he was when he was your age, a roar. He wants to get his physical body back to the point where he can roar again. And by God, he'll do it because his wife and his family just have put everything into bringing him back. So if you go, um, and, and look at the reports of his brain. His brain has completely grown over that slice. It is completely knit again. But what has made it knit is not the fact that the brain can rejuvenate itself, but his motivation. He says, I will not end my life like this. I will not be a vegetable in a, in a hospital. So if you want a, a, a story that really shows you how elastic the human brain is, look at him. So when I compare that model of what the brain is, in fact, there's a neuro um, psychiatrist that's working with him on this, but the, he's got a whole array of people who have helped him. But the whole point is that the human brain is an extraordinary piece of work. And so I think, um, to argue that we can establish one or two patterns that's, that's going to define a, an incredibly important value in human culture like evil or even like empathy, I, I'm a skeptic. So I think that's why Kim has brought me on board. You know, I, I think that some of you who haven't asked questions before might want to ask them today because yeah. this is quite a bit different. I'm not saying it has to be that way, but, you know, uh, or, uh, anyway, who, who else has, you guys, yay! <laughs> I'm wondering how you are putting ethics and empathy besides each other. Do you think they are going always together? or they can be opposite. Whether ethics and empathy yes. um, correlate to each other or um, are related to each other? Yes. Well, the assumption behind Simon Baron Cohen is that they are, that, that one can relate ethics and on the basis of that, the whole notion of evil, um, um, with this, uh, with this model of reality. That's what he thinks is possible. We have always linked empathy with uh, ethical sensitivity. We have always done that. 
um, he, in a way, is trying to argue um, that ethics as we know it then has to be modified because this is a behavioral structure and it's not a ethical structure. Um, I, I think probably that would be the subject of another discussion, but I can see where um, that's a really important issue to deal with. From his perspective, they are intimately connected and that the, that the lack of empathy uh, gives uh, birth to evil and cruelty and all of those things. Do I think that? Not necessarily. And it'd have to be a case, uh, we'd have to discuss a case by case issue of that. Okay, I guess that's it, huh? Are we done? Do we have another minute? Oh, I see the horde at the gate out here, or so. Oh, yeah, there are lots of uh, alive issues going on in your brain. I can see that. Okay, so the story you told about the soldier, that was really interesting. And uh, I looked it up. It's great. So you guys should definitely check that out. Uh, but considering what your opinion is about the robustness of the human mind, do you think that in the future humans and machines will interface in one way or another and whether that will be beneficial or not? Well, let me talk about computers. I, I don't have any doubt that eventually we will use computers to augment the human mind. And I think it's quite possible that in the near future we might embed uh, chips in the brain, especially if we want to do something that requires extraordinary uh, abilities, right? Uh, so I, that, for me, th this is what I would call human assistance. Um, can we build a, a machine that is so far beyond us that we can't relate to? Uh, perhaps, but it is not for me, a machine of any particular significance to us. I mean, um, certainly it might be possible for us to construct all kinds of machines that really don't relate to us. I don't find, I don't find that traumatic, <laughs> right? Because a machine that I can't relate to is not going to be anything that will have any significance for me. And I will not give a machine uh, that's supposed to have superior intelligence, uh, an ability to trump what the human race will do. That's my, that's my take on it. Okay, well, okay. we're out of time. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.